From the Foundation Studio right here on Biloxi's Back Bay, I want to welcome you to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime. The world-class outdoors of the state of Mississippi, because we are the capital of the outdoors in America. We say that every week, because we mean it, that's for sure. Um, listen, Merry Christmas to you. I can hear Bing Crosby singing, if he's the one who sings it, it's cold outside. There is some cold weather coming to Mississippi this weekend. And that ought to make my duck hunting friends really happy. I know we are. We're looking forward to some some ducks getting pushed down. And hopefully this is going to be you know a, a better season, as we've talked about the last few weeks, than, than we've had in the last uh, last couple of years. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi Radio Network. Man, we're, we're so fortunate to be here or on Super Talk TV at C Spire TV. But you might be listening on Facebook or YouTube or your favorite podcast. If so, it's December the 19th, 2022. Where did this year go? My goodness, man. I, it's like I can remember at the end of January saying, I can't believe it's already the end of January. And now here we are. It's the end of December. Merry Christmas to you. I hope you're, you're, you've got a great holiday uh, planned. And... Um, it's an exciting time of year to be in the outdoors, that's for sure, especially with some real cold weather coming. Hey, listen, I have a full show today with my friend, Lake Pickle. I'm going to go ahead and bring Lake into the show and say good morning to him, and then I'll remind you who he is. How you doing, my friend? Man, I'm doing great. Uh, couldn't be any better. It's a, it's a great time of year to be an outdoorsman in this state. Happy to be back on here on this show. I tell look, Every time I'm on this show, I'm reminded of how powerful this network is. Because I, I think I've told you about this before. Maybe it was in a private conversation. The first time that I was on a show with you, it was like the next day I got stopped at a, a gas station asking questions about the show. So y'all do a great job and gets me more excited every time you ask me to come on. So super pumped to be here and talk about Whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> well, like you, what's cool about you? First of all, you, you, you. We, we've, we've had a whole full story, uh, show to that before talking about your story. But people know you through the pre, uh, Primo's Truth About Hunting TV series. What a, what a great job Will has done with that over so many years. And then, of course, more recently, you're still working with them, uh, but you also are with On X. And we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about what On X is. And then you have the the Primo uh, Speak the Language podcast, which I've had the pleasure of being on, which uh, is doing quite well. Didn't you guys hit a million downloads? Yeah, we're at uh, we're actually we just passed we're over a million and a half now. Um, and then th check this out. So you know we we talked about I was building that I'm I'm working on building that Quail episode series. Yeah. My mom gave me an early Christmas present. That, oh wow! For people, that's okay. So for the radio audience, it's a big, uh, so maybe three by two by three black and white photo that looks like it's matted with four gentlemen in it. Who are those people? So the 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 man in the center, that's my grandfather, and the two men sitting directly beside him, those are my great uncles, and then that's a distant cousin on the back of the truck. Uh, but yeah, he's got an English pointer, and then. Uh, Uncle Jack there has a old Winchester and they're quail hunting back in the glory days when we had a lot more, you know, larger native population of quail. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's a, it's, you know, I, I love what you do with your show. So it's a little bit of uh, hunting stories and talking to cool people. And, uh, and I like what you're, what you're headed toward. And that is periodically doing some sort of special segments yeah. about something, for example, like, like quail and with the history of quail hunting in Mississippi and what the challenges and opportunities are for quail hunting in Mississippi. And you, it gives you the opportunity. I know, I know this from doing this show and my show on the, on the, on the coast called coast view. It's just, it's just every time you get a guest on, every time you decide you're going to get focused on an issue, you get, you get a chance to learn a lot, don't you? You really do, I, I, and I, that's been something that I've learned through doing this podcast. But yeah, I'd say I'm probably, I, I probably need, there's three or four key more people that I need to talk to for this quail subject, I think, to do it justice. But I've learned so much through the process of just the history of the state and then just beyond quail, just like what the state was and the what what you know, the, the changes in agricultural practices and the landscape, it's been, it's been very interesting. Well, you can go to your favorite podcast platform and just look up the um, Speak the Language podcast and, and you'll get to hear a, a, just a plethora of, of choices uh, that, that, that Lake has. 
then of course while you're there you can look up super talk outdoors as well and listen to our shows as well so we try to be there however whenever people want us because you know the truth is radio the radio network is really strong but sometimes people aren't aren't able to sort of tune in at this time frame and we wanted to be able to be on youtube or facebook and whatever but you mentioned something about the network as you probably well know i'm a former former media executive and uh, I always wondered about about radio. And what I've learned since I've been with this company is that Steve Davenport, who owns Super Talk Mississippi Network, and uh, Kim Dillon, who is the president of the company, they've really built an incredible company. For the, first of all, they own 26 radio stations across Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And then as part of the Super Talk Network, there are 12 stations that are geographically positioned. So there's literally nowhere in this state where you can be and not have access to a super talk station. Mm -hmm. But then in addition to that, Steve has the Ag Network. Of course, we have Sports Talk, which has been very important recently, obviously, unfortunately, with the with the passing of Mississippi State's coach, sure. uh, Mike Leach. Uh, the, the, the opportunity that the Sports Talks guys have to talk about his legacy and whatever you I, I can I, I can't imagine what the radio numbers are in the wake of that but we are the ones who lead those conversations that there are important conversations about the legislature Paul Gallo on the Gallo show or Gerard uh, will have those conversations if there are issues about the coast we're going to have it down here on the coast but but they've built this great network then but in addition to that though there are 25 other stations that are part of a news network so if say you and i when we're talking on super talk outdoors and we make news what happens is there's actually a news team that's going to capture what you and i talked about and then put a copy of what we talked about so they can see it in video form it goes to the news network so it's, if we make news it's going to go to 51 radio stations across the state of Mississippi, that's the way you build a strong company. You 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 have you have your your news and your information able to to get into all these stations on a moment's notice, and that's the way you can affect change in the state. So, Super Talk Outdoors is is really pleased to be a part of that. That 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 is for sure. Listen, I had a great weekend of hunting this weekend. I I was able to get a, a, a nice old ten point. Um, my hunting son, he's my one of my best friend's son who's been hunting with me most of his life. He got a beautiful 10-point. Uh, weather's starting to get pretty. They had a couple of good duck hunts over the weekend. You're hearing some good reports too, aren't you? Oh, for sure. I, I actually, um, like I said, with the, the, the Onyx transition, I haven't been, you know, in the trenches with the Primos guys like I have been in previous years. But I was at the new camp this past week and I knew what time of the year it was as do you. And I was like, what a perfect time to go down there. Right. <laughs> uh, and so the first afternoon, uh, I, I was sat in a green field, a food plot and, uh, saw, saw about a dozen deer total and then saw probably a four or five year old. He was a five point, but there was a bigger deer that they were wanting to shoot. And so they were like, that's a deer that we would definitely kill, but we don't want to blow the food plot up. But anyhow, this old five point deer was chasing those does around all evening. And of course, as a person that enjoys outdoors, that was a very, very fun sit in the, in the hunting blind, for sure. We got to watch a lot of fun stuff, see a lot of deer. Um, and that's kind of what, like, I think we're just on the brink of it. I think it's just going to get better for the next few weeks. Yeah, I had a, I had I passed on a, about a three year old ten point. We got it on camera, in fact, this morning, and it was uh, we got it on camera like just after midnight. So your point about when you shoot, when you shoot, make sure it's the one you want because the mature deer, you know, they they're gonna vanish for a short period of time. Now some might go away and not come back. Some might come back and it might be late at night, but you you have to be really careful. You know, and like if you want you want to take a doe. At the, when ruts really start to t- p- pick up and you see a bunch of bucks on a field, this is not the time to take the doe, is it? Especially, you know, because food plots, I mean, you could do that. If I was hunting in the woods and I see that old deer, I pro- I would have shot him. Different different scenario. But a food plot is such a destination for those deer and they're using it as a food source and you want them to get comfortable with it. And so you go, I mean... Obviously, you can shoot deer in food plots. We do it all the time. We just try to be kind of more judicious about how we choose what deer we shoot in those food plots. Especially during the rut. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> especially, especially during the rut. Have you had the opportunity to do any duck hunting yet? 
I duck hunted, uh, not in honestly, not in Mississippi. Uh, I did a, took an Onyx trip and uh, did some goose hunting and duck hunting in uh, eastern Montana for a few days. Uh, yeah. In a in a dry field in a in a cut corn field, which I had never done before. So that was pretty cool. Uh, that was it. It was it was a lot of fun. But as you were alluding to the cold weather we got coming down. My, my wife sounded like she was in peril when she saw the forecast, whereas I was like, what's the big deal? You know how good the <laughs> duck hunt is going to be? You know? <laughs> my, of course, it's, going, it's supposed to be in the 20s, the low 20s on the coast for three or four consecutive days. And, um, of course, we're worried to death about our palm trees, and I've got some work to do about that. But listen, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Lake Pickle. I want to find out about this Onyx gig that's taking them across the United States. We, uh, we're going to, I want to get his thought about the selling of white-tailed deer and how that's a departure from the, her the heritage of, of outdoors in Mississippi. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation. Mississippi. the conversation on Mississippi's outdoors. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. I have my friend Lake Pickle. Uh, you know him from the Primo's Truth About Hunting uh, TV series or from his uh, Speak the Language podcast. He's also more recently with OnX, and we spent the first segment just kind of sharing a few stories. But hey, tell us about your OnX gig. Yeah, man. So uh, Onyx was, I've been a customer, a user of Onyx since around 2017. And so it made, you know, like working for Will for nine years, I'm a big fan of keeping it authentic, you know? And so going to work for Onyx was easy for me because it was something that I was already a big fan of. Um, so I, I work in their marketing. Uh, I work a lot. I, I pretty much manage all their social media channels, Instagram, YouTube. A little technical issue. That's okay. We keep going. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, so a lot of content creation I, and it's been fun because I've gotten to do like, obviously, I love hunting whitetails at home. I love duck hunting at home. But like I said, that Montana trip, it has allowed me to do um, some things that I haven't been able to do in the fall. Uh, whereas when I was with Primo's full time because we were deer hunting so much, I've gotten to do some rough grouse hunting in northern Wisconsin. I've done pheasant in Minnesota. Uh, pheasant in South Dakota, did uh, sharp tail grouse in Montana, as long as well as Canada geese and mallards and dry field hunting. So it, it's been a lot of fun because, I mean, I'm sure you've heard me talk about my bird dog, you know, like Knox. Um, so, yeah, me being crazy, I drove my truck to Montana. Like I drove the entire way, but I wanted to bring the dog. So, yeah, it, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that, I'm, that's exciting. You know, it's interesting because you and I had the opportunity to visit with you on your podcast, and we spent nearly the entire hour talking about why I believe Mississippi is the capital of the outdoors in America. And you who have been really all over the United States, you don't really make a corresponding argument against it. I mean, you were raised here. <laughs> you couldn't have picked a better foundational place to grow up and enjoy the outdoors, could you have? No, I, I mean— I mean, go to what time of year we're in right now. Like, if you are someone who appreciates the outdoors, appreciates the, out the ability to hunt, um, I mean, this is the time of year where when I think about our days at Cottonmouth, this is the time of year that we were deer hunting in the morning because it was the rut. Or no, I'm sorry, we were duck hunting in the morning and deer hunting in the afternoon. I mean, there's just so much to experience um, and then obviously you go from now, like the, the, the duck hunting and the deer hunting being as good as it is, it'll maintain that way until the end of January. And then you go into turkey season and then you go into the summer and you got fishing. And then next thing you know, it's fall again. There's, there's always something to do. So yeah, I, I don't really have an argument against that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm glad you don't <laughs> cause that, you know, I say on my show all the time that I, you know, I don't care what state you're from. Let me know who you are. And I'll stand toe to toe with you and debate you, and I bet I win, because I just got this is too much. There's too much to draw from, and they may have certain dimensions that are better, but when you add it all up from the Mississippi Delta to the hills to the coast and what we have 
ac access to here in Mississippi. And I think it's good for me to continue to make that point because I think sometimes we get a little bit too, we might get complacent. Maybe that's not the right word to use. We certainly take it for granted. That's probably the best way to say it. We take it for granted that the uh, the hunting and fishing and just general opportunities to enjoy the outdoors in Mississippi are just so incredible. One of the things, you know, and we talked about this before, but, you know, you spend a lot of time on public land. But you know, if you think about the WMAs that Mississippi has and the work they do to bring ducks in and the thousands and thousands of acres they have for, for turkey and deer hunting and other, other outdoor enjoyment, this state gets it, doesn't it? They do. Uh, and, yeah, the, our – the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, and this is not me taking a pop shot at, at other departments. It's just through the travels that I've been able to do, I've been able to look and be like, man, our department does a really good job. They do an excellent job. Um, and yeah, I, the, the public hunting opportunities we have here are great. Um, the private land op hunting opportunities we have here are great. Yeah, it, it's, there's, there's plenty of opportunity within this state. It makes me proud as an outdoorsman to live here. Me too, man. And one of the great things about doing this show is that I have the opportunity to, to be joined almost weekly by one of those professionals from the department that I invite in to talk about anything from wild hogs to white-tailed deer to ducks. I mean, I mean, the regular listeners know that these are some of the most dedicated public servants we have. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, it's interesting. They all literally dedicated their lives so that we can enjoy this this outdoor heritage that we have and be able to, to uh, pass it to our kids and our kids' kids. They're, they're really focused on sort of this generational thing. And it shows in all their work. And, you know, someone like you who does travel around, and sees different approaches and different, you know, different ways to do things. It helps you compare and contrast, doesn't it? Very much, uh, very much. It, you know, it, it comes from the 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 history of Mississippi's, you know, relationship with our resources. I think part of the reason that our professionals in place in the department do such a good job is because they very highly recognize that it's not an unlimited resource. It's very much, it's finite. It has to be managed. And the people in our department, they recognize that. And uh, I think that's why they do, part of the reason why they do such a good job. Yeah. Okay. So let me, just for, just for people who, who may be confused with some of the terminology, because it can, it can actually get kind of confusing. You have a department of wildlife fisheries and parks and, and the folks that I have on my show are the ones, these professionals that lead from parks to, again, for whitetail, deer, ducks, WMAs, lots of professionals that are out there working day to day. They're the ones on the ground operationally following through on the strategies that the department wants. And then you've actually got a commission, the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Commission. We'll come back in just a second and kind of break down the commission a little bit. But they're, they're the ones that sort of oversee, they just establish regulations, et cetera. And, um, you know, it's really important that we have a good, strong commission at all times because the department oftentimes is taking their lead from the commission. And uh, it's important for the commission to listen to the department because you've got all these scientists there. So there can be, you know, there can be some fine lines between public input and politics and, and the needs of the, of the department or the science, science view toward how to, how to best manage the, the wildlife. There's always going to be a bit of a rub there. That's just the, that's the nature of the beast and the nature of change. Then, of course, you have the foundation. The foundation actually is the title sponsor of this show. Their former name, is, formal name, is the Foundation for Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, separate 5013C organization. They are an organization that was literally formed by, um, you know, wildlife and conservation leaders, you know, mostly uh, just civic minded people who wanted to uh, raise money to help fill gaps for the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks. So they have a wide variety of issues that they're involved with. They also do do occasionally some investment in uh, wildlife and conservation organized, uh, uh, projects that are not directly tied to the department. And then more recently, they've gotten really involved in issues. Uh, the most important issue more recently, Jay, uh, Lake and I spent some time on on Super Talk Outdoors talking about this. We talked about it a little bit on his show as well, but the Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund that was passed by the legislature this year and signed by the governor is a great example of an issue that they, they would be involved in. So what I like to say is when they pick an issue, 
if you're on the opposite end, you better look out because they, their ability to bring the coal, a coalition of other organizations into the conversation, it is very, very significant. And that's the kind of leadership we need. But those, just to kind of give you a sense of the foundation is this, the commission does this, and then you have a Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, which is uh, which is the part that that that. The lake has the opportunity to see in action when he travels all across the United States. He's got a great point of comparison. That's why it's, I'm, I'm privileged to have the ability to talk to someone like Lake who has this opportunity to challenge all over the United States. Hey, so we'll, we'll, I want to ask you your opinion about something. I want to just kind of at a very high level kind of frame the issue a little bit. And then I want to get your, your thought on it. But then I want to take a step back for a second, and I want to come back to talk about the commission. Who's on the commission? Who are the people on the commission? Where do they come from? I watched a, a commission meeting from last week, and I'm, I have to tell you, I was kind of concerned about something I saw, and I'll, I'll, I'll share with the, with the radio audience what, what I saw. But there's this, uh, there's this issue that's, ha that's kind of simmering behind the scenes. Uh, there was an attorney general's opinion in October that said the commission can make this decision, which essentially would make it legal to sell white-tailed deer in Mississippi. And this is a really important issue because it is a significant departure away from the way Mississippi has managed wildlife up to this point. And it's being led by a small group of high fence owners. There are about 125, 125 high fence owners in Mississippi. Having a high fence in Mississippi was legalized. But if you go read the, the regulation around that, what you'll see is at the very top, I'll almost immediately see, you cannot sell white-tailed deer. And essentially, they, they did it so that you can manage the herd on your property better. There are, there are minimums that 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 are that are required, and then of course there are there are uh, permitting and other things that have to be done as well. But it's important to note that the white-tailed deer on the inside of the fence are the same as the white-tailed deer on the outside of the fence. These are all owned by us, the people. Why is that important? Well, it goes back a long way. But when we had colonial America. The king in England are, is the one who owned the deer, and they also owned the firearms. And when America was formed, it said, we're going to go in a different direction. We're going to make it so that the people own the deer. The people own the deer. Really important distinction here. And it also is about managing the resource. So when we come back on the other side, we'll continue to sort of break this down. I want to get I want to get Lake's uh, uh, point of view about this. I'll tell you a little bit more about the commission and tell you what you can do if this is uh, an issue that comes up. We'll see you on the other side. This is Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. When we went to break, Lake and I were about to get into a conversation about the potential for making it legal to sell white-tailed deer in Mississippi. Well, the only thing I wanted to add is that you know, essentially wildlife belong to the public. That's really important. But it really matters when you're dealing with something like chronic wasting disease, and it matters when you're talking about hunting regulations. You don't want different regulations to exist inside that high fence that exists on the outside when you're dealing with CWD or any other disease or any other need they might have. You want to make sure that the herd's being managed by the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And any change away from that is a it could open up Pandora's box. Believe me, it is a very, very significant issue, and you're going to hear a lot more about it. But as I was saying, about 125 high fence areas, about 99% of the guys who own high fence areas, they don't support this issue. They're not behind it. This is being controlled by two or three or four high fence guys that are extremely rich, extremely well connected, and they want the ability to be able to sell their deer. And um, and if, if we go in that direction, it's going to be a big departure from the kind of uh, wildlife management that this that's made this state the best. One other thing I'll add, the North American wildlife conservation effort that Aldo Leopold created, we signed up for that. It has served Mississippi really well. It's brought back uh, wild turkey and white-tailed deer and other species that 
is a really important to the conversation. Again, we don't want to do anything to threaten that. This Because of two or three people, we would be changing the entire generational way we manage wildlife in this state. And all you need to go do is read about Texas, what a mess it is in Texas. So anyway, Lake, what you, what's your sort of top of the top of the elevator here speech on this one? It's so this whole subject to me is concerning on so many levels. It's to the point where I'm like, I don't know which one to tackle first to some degree. So I just have to pick one and go with it. Um, I don't like how this kind of had the feeling that it was mostly done behind the scenes, tried to keep under wraps. Kudos to y'all. I hadn't heard anyone report on it until y'all did. Um, and so it, like the whole, if we go back to like one of the basis, one of the fundamentals of what wildlife management in this country, in this state is founded on is like you said yourself, they belong to the public. And so decisions like this, of this magnitude trying to be made and it being so hush hush, I don't like that at all. Um, one of the opinions that that I read that was put out about it, I believe by um, Lynn Fitch, one of my biggest issues with that is there wasn't, you go and, and you can go read that entire opinion. There really wasn't anything in there about the implications of what selling whitetail deer would do. The only thing that was getting argued in that opinion was, here's why we can do it. I saw hardly in, nothing in there that's like, hey, if we do that, we might should be cautious because it could cause X. The implication of this is there was nothing uh, that that touched on the wake of it. But like, let me, I, I don't, I'll let you continue. Let me just sure. interject here that Lynn Fitch's t opinion was very narrow and essentially, as you pointed out, it, it essentially said the commission can make this put this regulation in place. But it's a significant departure from the previous Attorney General's opinion that Jim Hood had, very lengthy, very comprehensive, and, uh, you know, reaffirming everything that you and I have talked about here, that that we have to protect Mississippi's wildlife legacy, and the way we do it is all wildlife belong to the public. So, Lynn Fitt, you know, it's interesting because, you know, uh, Jim Hood, who was a Delta Democrat, uh, has a very conservative view toward this resource, and his opinion was solid as a rock. And then Lynn Fitch, who, and by the way, she'll point out that she's she's issued opinions that differ from his before, but seems to me, I don't know if they had enough people engaged in the conversation inside her office that was, that really understand the implications of what she was doing. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that they did. Um, the other thing, it's, it's like, and this is a, this brought the light to a couple, like a, another line of thinking. I don't think overall i don't think that the state has there's enough information on high fences within the state you know because you know like you were saying there's about 125 high fences in the state i would bet that there's a that the majority of outdoorsmen were unaware of that another thing like and you touched on this as well they're not like we don't need to think that all 125 are pushing for this they're definitely not uh, but it's so like in the wake of what we already have going on with the concerns of CWD, I had uh, William McKinley on our podcast back during September leading up to the first velvet season that we, we had in the state. And I asked him, I said, what is the most concerning thing? Like, like, what are you most concerned about, about the future of whitetails and whitetail hunting in this state? CWD, CWD without fail. And so the sheer implications of moving live deer in the, in, in the sense that they're wanting to do with this are so vast and so like not like so much not close to being worth the gamble that it's it's asinine to me that this is even being considered. I can't I can't believe it. And I may sound like a little bit fired up, but that's because I am. Like I, I understand like why is this even being talked about? This 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 cannot happen. Yeah, I tell you, so what's interesting is, of course, the opinion, the Attorney General's opinion was this, issued in October, and uh, for whatever reason, again, again, I'm not, I'm not a reporter, I'm not out there, you know, digging constantly to try to uncover this, unless someone tells me about it, or unless it comes up on the show, I would not have known about it. 
But it came to me, and then I started talking to people about it. And what I saw is that the concern about it went from zero to 60 really rapidly. That what, what was happening is there a lot of work going on behind the scenes by these rich, highly connected people mm -hmm. to begin to sort of align the stars so that they could get the commission to strongly consider this. Now, I've been assured by, com by at least one commission member but actually, I could say at least two that they're going to, you know, there's going to be a public process here that they're going to listen to the public and and so on. I hope that I hope that's the case. I really do. Um, the commission, I should point out, are are appointed by the governor of the state of Mississippi. And uh, let me tell you who they are. There are five of them. One is Bill Coser, who's the chairman. He's from District One. Uh, Scott Coopwood, he's vice chairman. He's from District Two. By the way, Scott Coopwood has Delta Magazine. He also owns a newspaper. And uh, I've known him for a long time. I'm a former publisher. He's a publisher. We've known each other in that way. And Gary Rhodes uh, is from District 3. He's a commissioner. He was just recently confirmed by the Senate. He is the mayor of Flowood. And incidentally, he's been there for nearly three decades. And his reputation is incredibly strong. He is a, a fine leader, very progressive uh, leader. He's done a great job in Flowood. But I should point out that I've been told that he is a former owner of High Fence. However, I should point out, just like just like Lake and I just said, 99% of the 225 High Fence owners aren't behind this push. So I don't know where Gary is on this. I just bring that up. Um, he's a good leader, and I would expect that he would you know, bring great leadership to this. Uh, Billy Munger. I know Billy. I've hunted with Billy. Uh, he is a very smart, extraordinarily successful guy, and I there is no doubt in my mind that he will bring great leadership to a conversation like this. And Leonard Bentz from the coast, I've known Leonard for most of his life. Um, he's from District 5, and... Um, you know, I hear that he supports this move, but, you know, we'll let, let him say that in public and we'll see where we go. You know, I, I mentioned something, I saw something concerning to me, and I it speaks it's speaking specifically about Leonard, about Leonard Bentz. I watched the commission meeting last week just because I was curious about whether this was going to come up or not. And it didn't come up. That's important. It didn't come up. I did hear that some people that were sort of maybe behind this came to the meeting for a short period of time and then left. So maybe they were just seeing that if, if this was going to be on the agenda. But what I saw, a couple of things happened. One is that Ed Penny from Ducks Unlimited was there. He was concerned about the recent decision they made in Claiborne County, which uh, I think was a departure from what the what the department wanted around CWD management. And, and they made a decision without public input. And that was concerning, and Ed Penny went there to talk about it. You got, people should go watch that video for themselves, but I was incredibly unimpressed with the way Leonard Benz talked to Ed Penny. He was disrespectful. He was, uh, he, was, he, was, he was very strong in the way he came on to Ed, and Ed was there as a, as a, as a private citizen, not representing Ducks Unlimited, but he's a, this guy is head of public policy for Ducks Unlimited over multiple states. He is a, one of the most well-respected conservation leaders in this state, and I just was unimpressed with the way that Leonard Bentz treated him. But more concerning than that was the U.S. Uh, Forestry Service uh, employee, it's a, the forest supervisor, uh, Shannon Kill Killerty was there. She's an ex-Marine. Uh, she manages 1.2 million acres. Um, she's been a great partner to Mississippi. Her dad, incidentally, had a key role in Air Force One. Uh, I could go on. What, I mean, just a solid, solid person. But the U.S. Forest Service had adopted some safety regulations exactly similar to the to the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And Leonard Bentz called her out for adopting those in a vacuum, and all she was doing was mirroring what the department did, and he was, seemed unaware of that. So it was he was uninformed, he was unprofessional, and he was disrespectful twice in that one meeting. But you look, that's my read on it. You go, I've known Leonard for a long time, but I was I was not happy with the way he handled himself as a commissioner. Go do a search, watch the video yourself, see what you think about it. I, you know, so that's aside from the white white tail deer issue, but still, I think it, it could play into this this hand in a big way. Hey, when we come back, we'll continue this conversation about the sale of white tail deer in Mississippi with Lake Pickle from Primos and Onyx. We'll see you after this.
We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the outdoors. So let's talk about it. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. I have my friend uh, Lake Pickle from Primos and Onyx, and we're just talking about our love of the outdoors and how this um, the selling of whitetail deer issue that could come up in January in front of the commission. Um, it's, it's a, there's a lot of scuttlebutt behind the scenes right now, so we don't really know what the strategy is. I hope someone puts it to bed. I hope it doesn't come up and we don't have to deal with it. Because what I think is going to happen, you're going to have us fighting with one another. And it's in a world of anti-hunters, the last thing we need to be doing is having a fight with one another. The other thing that it does, is, as Lake pointed out, it's going to bring serious focus to high fence again. We're going to have to have that conversation again. And the eth- ethics of selling hunts inside high fence area, canned hunts. There's a lot of... A lot of disgruntlement about that in the in the outdoors community, and especially in the anti-hunting community. We just don't need this. I hope leaders come to their senses and don't even bring it up. But if they bring it up, I've already seen one of the most solid coalitions building behind the scenes that I have ever seen on any issue. Um, and it's a, it's a big deal. But this is not the first time we've been in this position, is it, is it uh, Lake? Unfortunately not. Um, this reminds me. Of, of instances that came up not long ago at all. Um, just in the past in the past year, we had if you we had the deal come up with Malmation WMA where there was the argument over having the buffer zone between the private line. I think it was 100 yards on either side that got shot down, thankfully. Um, and then just this past spring, there was the push. The, the similarity I see between this one because the the Black Prairie WMA thing was also one of those deals where it seemed to be tried to be kind of kept by under wraps and then it kind of leaked out, and turned into a whole thing that got shot down as well. The the similarities I see there are just again just these ideas that are m- making it to the table so to speak that I as an outdoorsman, you as an outdoorsman, look at and be like, why is this even being discussed? This is so far out there. Like, no, absolutely not. But the thing that that gives me hope there is with both of those previous examples, there was public comment involved and it was very well known from the hunting community within this state that like, hey, this is not what we want to do. And I'm hoping that that's where this leads with this one, that they allow some public comment to weigh in on their decisions because I have strong faith in our hunting community that we will recognize this as something that is very damaging and goes far beyond affecting one single thing. It's, it, it will have ripple effects if it happens. Well, you're, it's a great point, Lake, and, and those two issues you brought up are great examples of how it almost happened, but there was there was a commenting period. People came to their senses. They voted properly, and 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 we you know we were able to, to to deal with it. But this issue, those issues pale in comparison to this issue. This issue is a generational issue, and it goes against everything that we stand for as a wildlife community and conservation and hunting community in the state. And um, you know, I, my focus is just on educating people and letting them know about the commission, who's on the commission, and then and then how the commission gives its sort of um, you know uh, strategy or so on to uh, to the department. I hope they listen to the department. I hope they listen to the community. Over seven hundred thousand fishermen and hunters in the state of Mississippi, they'll be loud. They'll be heard loud and clear on this one because a few people want to make a major change that will affect hunting and how the department operates for the rest of our lives and our kids' lives. It's that serious. And it's time for us to 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 get educated on it and and be part of the be be, be part of the solution. When we come back after the first of the year, we'll uh, see what the department does and we'll go from there. But any any other words you want to say on it, Lake, before we, we shift? One one short thing is, I, so I worked for a, a company called Midwest Whitetail in 2012, and I did a little photo journalism at that time. There was a somewhat similar incident that went on in Alabama. There was a push back in 2012. There was a, a privately owned company that wanted to take um, captive high fence bred deer and release them into the wild. And, and it kind of the same, they weren't trying to sell them, but they wanted it, the, the implications were similar because it was gonna affect the wild populations. What happened there, luckily it was the same one of those deals is they were able to get it in front of public comment and get it in front of people that knew the science, knew the ecology, knew the, the possibilities of what could happen. 
and we're simply did not allow it to go through. And so I'm hoping that we have a simple, a, a similar turnout here. Again, I'm not happy at all that this is even being discussed, but I have faith in, again, I have faith in our hunting community and I have faith in the people that are put in place to know the right thing to do. And the right thing to do is to not let this happen. We Here. have so many great leaders across this state that are involved in the conservation community. They are, they are, they're, they're getting their, their education done and they are reaching out to their brethren. And if this comes up, people are going to be loaded to bear on it. There ain't no doubt about it. And your point about Alabama, if you go across the United States, you see courts across the United States have been, have been ruling on this one. And, uh, and you know, it's just kind of a mess, to be honest with you, where this at. Let's don't create a mess in Mississippi. I, I appreciate you coming on late because you and I represent two different generations, and this is a generational con conversation, and I really appreciate you taking the time to, sp to, uh, to spend some time with me today. I appreciate you having me on. I really this do. has been Lake Pickle from the Primos team and from Onyx, and he's just a good friend of mine. And uh, we'll come back after the first of the year and, and give you an update about where we are on this issue. I can assure you we will not let go. Take care. Have a great uh, Christmas. We will see you next Monday.